Okay, so let me just um, kind of So I'm going to call the uh, meeting of the Finance Committee to order. Um, it is uh, November 10, 2020, and the time is five minutes after 2 p.m. And uh, this meeting is being held um, virtually uh, pursuant to the governor's order um, that uh, allows for meetings to be held in, the, uh, in a remote fashion um, because of the COVID crisis. I'm going to check with members of the committee to make sure that everybody can hear and be heard. Um, go across my screen for order, Bob Hegner. Can I hear you? <clears throat> yes. Uh, Pat D'Angelis. Yep. And Kathy Shane. Yes. Uh, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, Bernie, you're here now. Yep. And I'm here. Uh, Sharon Povinelli. I'm here. Andy, I don't know whether you got my email. I, I might... did. Okay. You're going to have to leave. Sorry. But, um, and Dorothy Pam. Here. I think that's it for the committee. Um, so what I... Um, want to do is um, find out from the uh, fire chief, Chief Nelson, as to whether there are time constraints that indicate that we should take uh, reverse our order on the agenda slightly and um, so I ask to see if there are questions about the proposed um, purchase of the uh, fire uh, the ambulance equipment. Uh, are, uh, shall we just do that as a courtesy to our two staff people? Yep. Well, okay, so, so we're gonna do that. I'm gonna ask Sean to quickly summarize the uh, request um, so you don't have to go into detail because the town manager um, provided us information yesterday, which was in the packet for the council members. And I think I forwarded, uh, hopefully, to members of the, the other members of the committee who don't get the council packets. So, um, Sean, do you have anything um, that you want to say as an introduction before we turn it over to um, Chief Nelson? Yeah, I'll just I'll just add briefly to what Paul already wrote in the memo is that um, when we were developing the capital plan this year, the amb this ambulance was actually on there um, for replacement. And as you know, we we reduced capital and we created a reserve, and we had reached out to department heads to find out what their capital needs are that could become urgent during the year. And this was one that Chief Nelson had raised very early on that this ambulance was sort of on its last leg. So it wasn't a surprise that it that it broke. And so, um, you know, we do obviously support the replacement of it. And would the purchase come uh, um, from the ambulance fund, except for the amount of the grant that um, yeah. pays for that special equipment, which we discussed last night? Yeah, so that's when we looked at the ambulance fund last time, there are sufficient funds to purchase um, to pay for the ambulance out of that fund, less whatever grant proceeds we can use. In the, in the last question that I'm going to ask in the preliminary to you uh, is whether there's any concern that you have about the balance that would be remaining in the ambulance fund for other purposes, either for operating budget or for capital. Um, I'll look to Sonia. She's, she's got more of the history on the fund. I think when we looked at it, um, we brought in a little bit more money than we were expecting at the end of last year. And so that boosted our balance up enough where we felt comfortable going, paying for the, uh, the ambulance fund as opposed to the capital reserve. Um, but and, uh, Sonia, do you want to weigh in on sort of the history of that balance? Yeah. Um, well, the balance in that has been declining mainly because of losing Hadley a year and a half or two years ago, and then COVID happening. But at the beginning of the year, when we were looking at this for the ambulance, there was uh, we carried over a balance of eight hundred thousand dollars, and I think we're using about what two million for, for the, the for the twenty-two budget. Yeah. 
So that leaves us a little under a million to collect through the end of the fiscal year. And I think we're gonna be fine with that, but it's COVID, this has been a year from hell. I don't know what 21 is gonna look like. So from what I'm looking here right now, I think we're good. And if we were not yeah. able to, I can't raise my hand uh, because I'm, I'm now a co-host. If we were not able to raise the money, then we would just have to go to general operating or, right. we would or be capital be reserves to pick it up. Yeah, we would probably look to the capital reserve at that point. We would come back right. and, and look at to that point. Yeah, yeah. we dropped and it significantly. The order. the order is for the ambulance fund. I'm gonna bring the order up now. The order is for the ambulance, that's what I thought. Right. Okay. Um, as I, as I remember, it was from the ambulance fund. The way I look at it is we are paying for this either way, whether it's general fund or it's ambulance fund. So it seems appropriate to come out of the ambulance fund. So I, I think it, it's the right way to go. I don't quite know how to explain it. Um, and I guess I'll do the last question and then we'll um, get to the more specifics from uh, and ask the chief make his presentation then see if there are questions from the committee. Um, the, and John, you'll have, you can maybe answer this later too, but um, I don't recall now all the details as to whether you had put an amount in the budget for the ambulance fund for operating purposes or to support the budget as a whole. Yeah, we so we had cut it down significantly for FY21, um, down to about $1.8 million of support for the for the budget. Um, and for FY22, we brought that up a little bit, up to $2 million. So we do have an estimate in there for now. Um, we'd, we'd obviously like to keep that number going up, but we still want to be conservative as we kind of come out of the pandemic and we we keep track of the um, the revenues being generated by the ambulance. So once again, uh, Sonia, I should have taken the notes on this. The current balance in the ambulance fund in the amount you're hoping by the end of the year. The current balance right now is about 1.2 million. And when you in, um, when you say That's the, September. Hmm? That's at the end of September. And uh, when you were giving a number for which we were hoping to get to. We're looking to take use $2.3 million this year. For 2 million for 22 and the 300,000 right now for the ambulance. So that, uh, gives us an indication of what it is that we would be looking for in coming revenue. Right, for 21, we used 1.86 million for fiscal year 21. So we've just increased that a little and the 22 projections are just that, they're just projections. We don't know where we are yet. And maybe Assistant Chief Olmstead can talk about this a little bit during the presentation, but we did increase rates um, in the last year or so, right, Jeff? Yes, we did. Okay, so, so we, we are anticipating just higher levels of revenue in general, just from the rate changes that we've made. I think they'll see, you'll see an offset of the fact we increased the rates, even though we will have less overall calls. There's gonna be some balancing between those two and, and Sonia can explain that probably, you know, in more detail. So are there are other questions of Sean right now, or can we uh, turn the ask uh, Chief Nelson to give yeah. the presentation that he wishes? Yeah, no, I think it's um, let's turn it over to Chief Nelson. Chief, good afternoon. Uh, howdy, how you doing? Okay. So, uh, you know, this is pretty, pretty straight, straight to the forward, 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 forward. 
and we're trying we want we need to replace that 2011 am 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 ambulance we're probably a year or so behind on our on our replacement schedule and uh when we deferred deferred it the last the last time we we said that it's it's going to die and you know and it's getting and it's become coming a maintenance hog if 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 you will and that's exactly what happened happened we parked parked it uh geez jeff what we parked parked about two months ago i guess probably yeah closer to Oh, sorry. Sorry. The three. Yeah. So we, we had to park 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 it because it did it, it had a serious serious series of oil oil leak. And the only only way to fix fix it was a thirty three thousand thousand uh, dollar and an engine replacement replacement, which is just that 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 just doesn't work. So so that so so it's 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 a case case where you know we we need to, we need to, need to replace replace it. We 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 are a four that's uh, probably, probably consistent for am, 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 ambulance uh, service service, and with that you need you need you have you have to have five if if you're going going to run four because there's all there's always one one down for one reason or, or another you know so and this is and then, and this will get get us back back to where we need to be. One of the interesting things is that uh, we were able to work work with Stephanie Chicarello on getting on obtaining obtaining a grant. Uh, that'll help pay pay for a zero. It's, it's called zero R, 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 RPM. Uh, what what it is when you idle? Uh, when you when you stop to I, uh, I, uh, idle, whether we're on we're on scene or at the, or at the, 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 the hospital, it'll shut shut the the engine and the, the engine down. But you still have uh, use of all the equipment. And then periodically it'll start as if, if you're if you're there if you're stopped stop for long long enough it'll start start itself back 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 up up again to re, 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 recharge the batteries. So you know that it, it's you know it's clean it's cleaner it's greener it'll and, and it cut, cuts down down on emissions. So and again it's it's gonna be, it's going to be uh, similar to what our 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 three the three M M M ambulances that we have now we we switched some time time ago to a Ford ch 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 chassis and and we found that they've they they treat treat us a lot a lot bit better that we we're, we're, we're getting good good uh, good good work and good good life out of out of, out of, out of those so but they, they but that's they, they based basically it it's 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 uh our our, our fifth am 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 ambulance has been parked beached or whatever because it died so and we do and and and, and it's in, in need need a replacement uh, we're bound to and we're 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 seeing a slow but steady steady in, in, in increase in our uh, our our call call our call ball call, call, call volume now that it took a severe hit uh when when the, when the uh pan, pandemic hit but we we see that that it's it's it, that it's 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 you know, it's going 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 to to, to to increase. We say it it'll increase quite 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 a bit once the va va vaccine is out and available available across the board. So, uh, and with that, I mean, you know, any quick quick questions? Feel feel free. Uh, yeah. All right, hear, hearing none. Okay, we're we're done. All right. <laughs> I, I, I totally support this. I just have a couple questions. Sure, sure. First of all, how much does the technology inside, uh, in terms of being able to, you know, have better equipment and stuff like mm -hmm. that, how much does that change over, say, a period of five years? Yeah. I'm going to defer to Lindsay on that one a little bit. I think, you know, he can describe a little bit some of the management system that comes with these trucks and, uh, and maybe more detail. Well, well, he then he's, he's, he's at a, another meeting, but I'll, I'll tell you. I'm, I'm here. Can you see that? He is? Oh, really? I don't see him. Okay, great. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, Lynn, uh, first of all, when we buy a new ambulance, um, in terms of equipment that is uh, not physically part of the vehicle, uh, we don't get any new equipment. So the price you're seeing in front of you is purely for the vehicle and whatever's built into it. Um, things like um, a heart monitor is an example. That's portable equipment and that's bought separately and rotated and replaced on a separate schedule um, because that stuff does need to be updated much more often. 
um, in terms of the technology actually built into the ambulance. Um, from a patient care standpoint, not a whole lot changes, to be honest, in five years. What actually changes a lot is um, safety components, like any vehicle. So it's safety for our people. Um, nowadays, these vehicles have, as an example, airbags, um, not just in the front like you would in your car, but they actually have airbags, if you can believe it, all around the patient compartment um, to protect the uh, EMTs who typically are not seat belted in because they can't be while they're taking care of a patient. So it's a lot of uh, safety features uh, like that that you're gonna see change. Um, the other thing that we see is after you get up to over 150,000 miles, which is what we see after about six, seven years, um, these vehicles are just beat. You know, They're going back and forth to the hospitals, very rough service. Um, so just the vehicle becomes clunky as well as the maintenance. Um, um, headache. And in this case, as the chief mentioned, one thing this ambulance would have would be the hybrid system uh, to help push us into the, uh, you know, green communities end of thing. And just to talk quickly on that a little bit more, um, it's not just doing the right thing, although this has not been out that long. It's supposedly in the type of service we'd be using it in, in an ambulance, have a very short payback compared to a lot of sustainability um, systems, you know, some things take 10, 20 years to pay back. Supposedly between fuel savings and maintenance savings, this has a three to five year uh, dollar payback in our type of service. So we're fairly encouraged by what we're hearing about it. The fuel savings are, I have a couple of questions, just if you don't mind. Uh, the fuel savings basically are, are because you're not having to run the engine while you're idling. Correct. Our ambulances, if you look at mileage versus engine hours, they're way out of proportion to most vehicles because it doesn't take us that long to drive somewhere, but we can sit literally on scene uh, for 20, 30 or more minutes at a patient's you know, house, uh, car accident, whatever. So we put on a lot of engine hours relative to mileage. And this hybrid system is shutting down the motor, as the chief said, when it's parked on scene and going to a battery backup. So you're saving fuel and you're saving uh, wear and tear on the diesel motor. Right. So, and I'm assuming that when you get a new engine, the oldest engine becomes kind of the back, the fifth, the fifth vehicle, the backup. Off of ambulances. Yep. Um, so this ambulance typically, and we would do it again, be, goes into the busiest slot in the department, which is the first out ambulance at a central station. Right. And it's just a domino effect that the others get moved around to the second, third, fourth and backup position. How many mirrors do you have to buy to <laughs> over the years? Uh, they're a little bit more gentle than, that. than <laughs> the fire trucks, but that is still an issue at central stations. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, Kathy, yeah. thank you. You're muted, Kathy. Kathy, I can't hear you. Kathy, uh, you're not showing us muted, but we're not hearing you. I don't know if you need to sign in again. Dorothy has her hand. Yeah, I'll we'll go to Dorothy and then come back to Kathy. So the question is, this sounds like definitely an improvement. Uh, just out of curiosity, is there any cleaner, greener ambulance in the market? Or is this the, the most advanced that we have at this time? Uh, I'll take that question again. Um, to the best of my knowledge, no, there is nothing else out there. We've uh, heard the question for 10 years plus now from JCPC about fire trucks and ambulances. Mm -hmm. um, can they be hybrid? Are there other alternatives? And until this year, we said no to the hybrid question. Mm -hmm. uh, this was only released about two to three years ago, this hybrid system. Mm -hmm. um, it really isn't. They are experimenting. I've heard of an all-electric fire truck out on the West Coast. Um, the jury's still out on that. It's incredibly expensive. It's a prototype. It's not mass marketed right now. So to the best of my knowledge, no. Um, uh, you can have the discussion about gasoline versus diesel, but from a fuel consumption standpoint, there's really no mm -hmm. difference there. So this truly, I, I think, is the it's a huge step from where we were to be able to go to this hybrid system finally in an ambulance. And by the way, it is available for fire trucks too. So that's something we can look at down the road. Okay, right. Thank you very much, Kathy. You gonna try again? I back on. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, it was a reboot. Um, I 
I hope I'm not repeating what Dorothy asked, but Lynn was um, asking about uh, the, the and you, you talked about the mileage versus the engine hours and that at a certain number of miles, the whole uh, machine dies. Does this idling system produce a longer life for the ambulance? Do we know, or is it too new to know it? That it's, you know, it's turned off for larger parts of time. So does engine oil, other kinds of things that are breaking down, you said one of them is just leaking oil. Is there any sense that this new technology might go for more mile, real mile miles because sure. of less wear on the engine? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you two answers to that. One is theoretically, yes. Um, the other side of it is it's still pretty new in the market, so it's hard to answer. My speculation is it's definitely going to help with the life of the engine because, as you said, it is shutting down when you're on scene most of the time unless it needs to come back on for heat or AC or power boost. Um, so, yes, you're putting less wear and tear on the engine. That's where you're saving on everything, maintenance costs, fuel costs. And theoretically, that would give a longer life to the engine. Um, you have to keep in mind, though, that the rest of the ambulance is still putting the same mileage on. And it's the mileage that beats on the physical vehicle, the chassis, uh, and the wear and tear on everything else. So at some point, the, just the, the vehicle itself reaches the end of its life. But from the motor, this actually should have a significant effect. And and I know you also can't answer this, but if Route 9 gets repaved and this roundabout actually works as opposed to snarling traffic, is that, uh, uh, or is it also just the Amherst roads that beat, beat up the engine? Beat up the uh, uh, chassis. I uh, I was actually I was, I was going to tag 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 on to that. It's just it's just roads. It's road miles, and there you know we're it we we have we have to go at least 10, 10, 10, 10 miles to to uh, the complete dick fur, further than than that for Frank Frank Franklin fur, 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 further than that for Bay State, and it's just the miles that pile up day after day after day. Sure. Uh, the the improved improvement of uh, the with the uh, the round round roundabout or rotary uh, that that's going 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 to help. But in 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 the grand scheme, in the long long run, we still have to go all all those miles out and all those miles back. And though and and as time go, goes on, it just builds up and builds up, and it just beats the heck out of out of out of and in any vehicle, but especially 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 ours. Especially the and and and, 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 and you, know. you know, I'm gonna I'm just gonna jump in here a little bit. You know, where where I see it historically, as far as the old age ambulances, is some way that you can appreciate who has back pain, who has a broken bone, um, and they start to grate because the suspension shot and it hurts. Like you're driving a truck. It is not like driving a car and at that time when the age gets to it, um, even though you try to keep the maintenance up on it and you do the best you can with it, the truck can only provide you so much when it gets old enough. Um, and it's, it's kind of like all of us, you know, start to hurt a little bit. And, but if you have somebody that has those kind of injuries, um, they feel it more in that, that, that ambulance. I, I promise you they do. Than the Bernie, brand new ones. Hey, uh, Bernie. Yeah. I, uh, um, our uh, EMDs were helping my neighbor out the other night. So uh, this is kind of near and dear to me. Um, I, I think the technology that's being talked about has been tried plenty of times right now on diesel engines for, for trucks. And I think it'll be a good addition for the ambulance. And I, I really do appreciate the care and, and, and caution that the fire department takes in, in bringing this forward. I know from uh, my previous service on the finance committee, we kept pushing back and pushing back on, on equipment purchases. So I really do think this is a, um, this is a, this is necessary. And, um, um, you know, it, it deserves a wholehearted approval of the committee. You know, I'd like to add, add one, one, one thing, uh, small, but, uh, since the chief John Strom, Strom, Strom mentioned that, you know, that this, this, this has been out for two or three years, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, te the, te the technology. We we made a kind of kind of conscious decision to wait a bit because it's because it's brand new, 
you don't, I mean, sure, it's, it's on, it's on, it's on, it's on the cusp and all, all that, but you, you really don't want, 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 want to be a beta, beta test that sounds, sounds something this important and, 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 and expensive, expensive. After, after two, two to three, three years, most, most of the bugs are going to be worked out. So, so that's, so that's, that was a kind of conscious decision on our, on our part. Um. So that answered one of my major questions is how long, but another one is where do you have to go for maintenance on the parts of this not, that are, you know, the new, the energy saving, is that close by? And what are the cost replacements um, for issues related to the new systems that save energy? Um, I'll answer that in terms of where it goes. Uh, any of the specialized components of our ambulances have to go back to the dealer, which is in North Attleboro. Um, I say the specialized components, if an ambulance needs a brake job, uh, that would go to the Ford dealership in Holyoke. Um, anything to do with the ambulance itself, it goes to the dealer. Zero RPM, which is the company that makes the uh, hybrid components, um, the technicians at the dealer are trained on that now. So that's where it would have to go for the work on it. Um, in terms of the cost, I don't have an answer to that question. It's kind of like when you buy, a, you know, an all electric car, the battery is the big part of it. If you ever have to replace that, it's a huge expense. Um, I don't know what the cost would be just to replace the, the batteries out of this total system. Um, on the plus side, we've had our Ford Escape hybrid now for I think nine, almost 10 years. And we have not had to deal with that and it's still running strong. So our one step into the hybrid market has been very positive so far. That's our fire prevention officer's car. Thank you for all your questions. All the answer, able to answer all the questions. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to- hey, Anything else uh, any other members of the committee or I, because I might come back to a couple of things. I, I do have one other question. Uh, how much, what is the total cost? How much is the grant worth? Uh, the grant is for they're the same answer. That if, I, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, the cost of the hybrid system is a $25,000 upcharge to the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And the grant, the sustainability grant that Stephanie was able to secure for us is for that full amount. Okay, thank you. So does that make the uh, purchase price 325 or 300? Uh, we're asking yeah. we're asking for the three hundred thousand for the vehicle and the other components that would have to go in it new like the uh, radios and new stretcher and new uh, power loader. No, it was the um, yeah. Go ahead. The, I, I, I think charge I for the additional equipment for allowing you to cut off the motor during idling. We we are Sean. Just correct me if I'm wrong. Where the three hundred thousand is all that has to be approved here because the other 25 is coming from the sustainability grant. So, so let me just lay out my understanding and, and Lindsay, you can let me know if this is correct. Um, so I believe the ambulance itself is 275 or around 275 and the yep. additional upcharge for the idling is around 25,000. So the total cost of the ambulance itself with the idling equipment is 300,000. So the authorization in front of you is for that full amount, but you'll notice that there's wording in that authorization or that order that allows for the acceptance of grants that we would use to reduce it. Okay, that's what makes sense to do. Answer my other, other question. Um, nope. Lynn, do you have anything else? So otherwise I'm gonna go back to Dorothy. Nope, fine. Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes, we hear you. Okay, so I just was wondering if uh, what kind of a um, <clears throat> insurance policy you had when you get a new ambulance. Um, is it um, a year manufactured uh, protection of the, against any defects, or um, is it, is the power strain? I mean, what some of it should be covered. So even though it's relatively new, you'd have some protection um, against there being some kind of problem with system breakdown. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Some of that um, when we buy, it is in the contract that we get, um, and it varies quite a bit. So something like the powertrain, the motor, transmission, um, typically has your what you would buy if you bought a new vehicle about a one year. Some things like the paint have uh, up to five years. An electrical uh, 
can be somewhere in that range too. I honestly can't tell you the specific warranty on the hybrid system, the zero RPM. If that's separate from the rest of the electrical, I would have to look, go look that up. Because that's what I was interested in because um, I mean, this sounds like this is a good thing to do and then, and, and obviously we're gonna do it. But um, when you're dealing with something that's kind of new, it's nice if there is some kind of um, warranty coverage on it. So I was just curious about that. And Chief Stromgren, Assistant Chief uh, Stromgren, maybe you can just quickly talk about where we're buying this from. This comes from a, um, a state contract. Yeah, correct. Fortunately, um, the MAPC is, a, we call it the state bid. So the Fire Chiefs Association of Massachusetts has one of many collective bids with the state. So something like buying this ambulance, we do not have to go out to bid for it, uh, go through that legal process and that delay. Um, basically, um, although it's a custom vehicle, I can't say it's off the shelf. Um, we order what we want. We already know what the cost is right now. That's why we're putting the price before you. That's what it's going to cost. And um, we don't have to go through the bid process. Basically, it's just a contract. It does go through town council, of course, but it's just a contract that we sign. It meets all the collective bar um, bidding issues in the state. Um, so it's, it's fairly straightforward. We don't have to go out to bid for it. We just order it as is. Um, the only downside, and this has nothing to do with it being on bid, is to get a custom ambulance is six to nine months turnaround time, no matter how you do it, which is why we're kind of anxious to get moving on this, because if we approve it uh, now, we still won't see it till the spring, which is why we don't want to wait till July of next year to push this forward. Uh -huh. Dorothy, did you have something or... You're muted though, Dorothy. Okay. Yeah, no, he answered my question. I'm fine. Okay. So um, I guess that uh, I'm just trying to still get my head around the numbers. And that, um, so if we have $1.2 million currently in the ambulance fund, and we're anticipating using 2 million for FY22, and three hundred thousand dollars for the ambulance purchase, though it could be reduced by the grant to some extent. Um, but assuming that high side, then that gives us um, a requirement to assume that we're going to be able to have ambulance fee income revenue of one point one million, and, um, and in addition we would need to um, hopefully do better so that we don't end up the end of 22 with no balance in the fund. Am I missing something in that, Sean or Sonia? No, I think that's right. I mean, that's what we monitor, you know, throughout the year is the, the ins and outs and what we've obligated of the ambulance fund. So um, we think again, between the higher fees that or the fees that were adjusted um, I know recently Assistant Chief Olmstead was looking at a grant um, with with Holly Bowser to try uh, that's basically I think it's a component of the CARES Act fund that's supposed to help offset some of the decreased call volume. We're not sure if we're going to get anything from that, but we're looking at that. Um, but we monitor this fund pretty closely throughout the year. Um, and this is also a fund that we get uh, revenue in from UMass as well. And, and those bills were sent out. And that's that's a looking back. Sonia, correct me if I'm wrong. That looks back a year. Um, right. so most of last year was sort of a normal call, call volume level when it comes to UMass, except for maybe the last three months that, that dipped down. Um, so in terms of that piece of it, which is a large piece of the billing, we won't feel the impact of sort of a, a fully depopulated UMass until next year. But then we'll have to put it in context a little, we normally take in about, um, well, previously to 29 to 20, um, 20, we took in about 2.7 million a year. Last year we took in 2.4. So I think we're gonna, right now we need to collect another 930 with this ambulance and, and for the fiscal year 22. So I'm confident that we're gonna collect that. And then beyond that, that's a question of what's available to then use for 23 for both uh, capital and for um, operating. So whatever we collect in 22 gets used for 23. 
That's how it works. It has, the money has to be in the fund. Okay. So I have one other uh, question for uh, Chief Nelson or anyone who from the department who wants to answer is, it was my understanding that we hired some additional staff who were um, from the call force, from the uh, student call force, that were able to provide some additional staffing assistance during the crisis. Um, was that paid for out of CARES Act fund and it, or, or was that paid for in other ways? And uh, what is uh, the projection of the um, ability to have that additional staffing or need to have the additional staffing going forward? Well, they, they were hired as, as a result of the Kikert crisis, and uh, the, 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 the intent will, will be to have care, care money co cover their, uh, their, their, their costs because they, they were hired strict, strict, strictly because, because of that, because, because, because of the pandemic. And right, right now, that, those funds last until December 3rd, 3rd, 31st of this, this year. So right, right now, that's as far, 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 far as we can keep them so they they they've been a great 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 asset to us because at the same same time we have we do have 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 some some folks folks out in in, in injured so so but the, but it it only right now it only looks like a, we're only going to the third third thirty first of the next of the next month. Okay. Other questions from the committee. I have another question, but it's not related to the truck. I mean, to the ambulance, but it's related to the fire department. I'm just curious, how many of your people are taking advantage of the testing at UMass for first responders? About uh, got about ninety to ninety-five percent of our people are doing it. Just just about, and what they're doing it, the shifts shifts are doing it gen generally. They're they're for first day back, so. But uh, yeah, okay. uh, folks folks have been taking advantage of that. Okay, because that also ends at the end of December. Right. Okay. So if there's no further questions or discussion, um, what I would like to do is see if somebody wants to make a motion to um, recommend to the council that um, the council approve appropriation and transfer order FY2105 b as recommended. So moved, DeAngelis. Okay. Seconds. Okay, so there's been a motion that's been made by Pat and seconded by Lynn. I think we've had uh, substantial discussion. Is there anything else to say on the subject? Oh, and in particular, are there any comments that um, the members of the committee who will not be voting want to put in the record? Uh, since there are no additional comments to be made. Uh, Bob, Bob Hagner just put his hand up. Bob. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say that I, you know, I think this is a very wise investment. I mean, we're talking about public safety here and we're talking about an investment in some technology that may actually help to uh, extend the life of the ambulance and, you know, obviously is good for the environment. So. Um, I, I, the only question that I had was whether we should pay for this out of, um, you know, the capital reserve, um, just to preserve the ambulance fund, but it, it, you know, it sounds like the ambulance fund is, is healthy enough to, to support this. So I think it's, it's fine. Okay. Anything else? Because otherwise I'm going to go through a roll call for the, uh, council members who um, to get a vote on this and um, I'll start with Pat DeAngelis. Yes. And um, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Lynn Griesmer. Absolutely. And I voted yes. So it's five to zero. So uh, thank you Chief Nelson and uh, Thank you, uh, Chief Trumgren, Chief Homestead. We really appreciate your being here to help out the committee. Um, and uh, 
we'll go on to uh, the next agenda item. You're welcome to continue, but I uh, know you have other things to do. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. For, for, appreciate it. Okay, Kathy, did you have your hand up before? Yeah, yeah I just had a um, suggestion, Andy, I know because you always write the report so well, capturing some of this conversation so that the larger council on a we're drawing the money from reserve, the total cost of the ambulance, the offset, just some of it, um, so that if we get these questions later, the report has already answered them. Um, not that I think the council is going to ask the same set of questions, but I, you know, just it'll be all recorded, so it'll be easy to come back to it, and Sean can make sure the numbers are right. <laughs> there's, uh, there's I, also, I, yeah. I was taking notes and writing numbers down. I was going with that in mind and so we can get through. So um, I think that what we're going to do for the next um, is yeah. to go back to see if there are questions that uh, you have for Sean regarding last night's um, presentation of the, at the financial trends and the projections for next year. And um, after, um, in, in this, then, then we'll uh, be able to talk a little bit about the process for developing budget guidelines and what we're going to do on developing budget guidelines. So um, I see questions from Kathy and Dorothy. Um, so go ahead. And if, uh, if you want anything from the um, presentation last night, such as the uh, the two page um, piece that has all of the detailed numbers. Um, Lynn, you can put that on the screen if you wish. But Kathy, okay. go ahead. That, that might be helpful, um, particularly if uh, Bob and uh, Sharon and Bernie didn't get a chance to look at it on the screen. So, my questions, um, Sean, I started one of them tonight. And I started, Are you putting it on the screen or am I? I, I don't have it. No, Sean, are you putting it on the screen? Yes. Sean is, uh, is, is muted at the moment, so. Um, Lynn, why don't you, I don't have it on my laptop right at this point. Okay. Um, right, but but I'll, I'll grab it and get it for you. Because okay, I so have it available also if you, need, if you can't get it. No, that's fine. Go ahead with the meeting, Andy. Okay. All right, so. The um, budget, the um, suggested budgets for the guidelines are basically flat, um, flat dollar amounts. So last night I asked about the CARES Act and to what extent we could pull in some of those funds. And I know, Sean, you just sent us something this morning, so I haven't really looked at it carefully. But I'm wondering, um, in the school budget, um, the, they got a certain amount of money from UMass. They were also so able to forward pay um, some, some costs so it didn't appear on this year's budget, you know, the current year's budget. So my sense, my questions are around particularly the school budget. I think it was the elementary school budget that did that um, because there were a lot of things that allowed them to come in at a flat budget without doing deep staffing cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, and so my question is how much of those are not going to be available for FY22? So that's the, that's the basic question. Um, and I know they, they, they did a little bit on the staffing side because they didn't fill a vacancy. They had someone on a, the equivalent of a sabbatical, someone wanted to go to part-time. So they, they picked up some FTE money without furloughing anyone or laying anyone off. So that's uh, that question. Then um, underneath, I'll just rattle them off because it is, it'll be also the library budget then. Um, last year, the FY21 budget, we were looking at budgets that had a two and a half percent salary increase um, baked in because of collective bargaining agreements from steps. And this year, we were told last night that the collective bargaining agreements, particularly for the schools, will are open. Um, and last year we had health insurance come in 
at a much lower than normal. And this year you're projecting at 5%. So I'm, I'm, the questions are, you know, if the salary base goes up at all and the health insurance base, which is a big chunk of the total is going up by 5%, how much are we up against layoffs or furloughs or, or some kind of reduction in force to live within this? And it's not to say that I don't think these are good guidelines, but just as to, 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 to so, so what's the anticipation within these? And the Jones Library dipped into its, re, its reserves, its endowment to even stay whole. And it's held a lot of positions vacant. Our North Amherst library isn't open um, and they didn't fill a librarian position, who, someone who retired. So just Jones is flat. Um, and last year they barely squeaked by with a flat budget. So it's particularly schools and the library that I was focused on. Okay, so let me kind of walk through some of those. So I think the first question was about the schools and some of the strategies they used to balance their FY21 budget and will those strategies be available for FY22? Um, it's possible they will be. Um, I'll, I'll just say generally, if you level fund something, it will usually result in reductions um, to your services unless you have something you know in your budget that you can reduce. Now, you know they did talk about enrollment going down and I'm not sure what their situation is around the number of classrooms they have. That's all stuff the schools will have to work out. Um, but generally, if you level fund something, we know that there's inflation, there's rising health insurance, there's rising pension costs. Um, so obviously wages tend to go up. There's always steps baked in every year. Even if there wasn't a COLA, there's always steps for, for union contracts. Um, you know, Generally, there will be reductions. So, so we do understand that when we start with this level of projection of a flat um, operating budget that that could result in reductions. So back to the school, um, it's a little too early to know if those strategies will be available to them. Um, don't think they've done the first quarter budget report yet. If they did, I think they might've just done it. Um, so that first quarter budget report will sort of inform a little bit of what might happen for this year. And then really the second quarter budget report is really the one that will tell more of the story. Um, but I'm not sure of what their sort of their budgetary picture is at this point until they, they complete the first quarter budget report. Um, but it's possible they may, they may be able to do some of those strategies. Like I think the thing you were speaking about is prepaying special ed tuition. You're allowed to um, pay so many months of the following year if you have the funds available. Um, and so I believe that was one of the strategies they use, which um, would be available to them again if they had the money. Um, to your second question about the library um or i think i touched on that a little bit yeah um services may need to be reduced if if by the end of this we're still at level funding um we noted a few things that we're going to find out over the next month or so that may caught bring us back to this where we will may revise these operating um, projections up a little bit um, those things are charter tuition is a big one that it dropped pretty significantly for FY21. And we want to see, or the, the estimate dropped pretty significantly for FY21. And we want to see if that is real. And we won't find out if that drop in charter tuition is real until December, because that's when the, the rosters go up. Um, there's state aid, more information on general state aid we want to see. Um, there's the PBTA assessment that I mentioned earlier. We want to get the, our assessment for this year so that we can start to gauge how the pandemic has impacted the PVTA assessment. Um, and then the last big thing is new growth. So we're, we're in the process of measuring and certifying the new growth in town, which is again, is an addition on top of the property tax levy. Um, and so we know we budgeted pretty low for that for FY21. Anything we come in above that in terms of the actual new growth will help next year's budget. So those are a few things that we will find out in the next, you know, four to six weeks that could, that should, you know, cost to revisit these projections and see if we can um, um, make some improvements. Does that help, Kathy? Yeah, it does help. Um, you know, and I, I, the, the last thing I didn't, it's clear from this set of numbers that you're, 
you're you're hoping with these guidelines that we can get back to eight percent for capital where we were at nine and um because we're paying off all we're paying off old debt service we're getting back to cash capital available that looks like two years ago um rather it's nearly double um so we we don't need uh, this is I'm, i'll phrase it as a question um if we depending on what decision we make about the library does the, the library debt that we would take on would not show up in 22 would it not show up in, in terms of an expense would it show up in 23 no that's a, that's a good question no we we've run some different models on that and um it's possible it may not even show up until later than that but we don't expect any debt from any of the building projects to show up in fy22 even if we move as fast as possible on any of them um it would just they would all require temporary borrowings and so actual debt payments wouldn't begin until after that okay thank you uh dorothy okay well i'm going to say that I am I am confused because I'm confused about the financial picture in town. Um, and first, um, I'm going to say I'm confused that we have not been asked for lots of money for schools. Um, we have just, okay, I, I, I do not have children in the Amherst Public Schools, but I'm hearing great, great unhappiness that school is not going. And for school to be able to go in the time of COVID, there have to be changes, major changes of a type which have not been happening. Um, and I'm gonna use as an, an illustration. My grandson was in Sunderland, was doing online school. Very good student, well-behaved boy, getting quieter and quieter and quieter. My daughter got very concerned. He is now at the common school, which is where they're outside most of the day. His mood is exuberant. He is a happy boy. He comes in, he's reading more. Everything is wonderful. Um, so watching that, and I'm thinking of all the children who are not in the Amherst Public Schools right now. I'm not just talking about kids with special needs. I'm talking about kids like my grandson, just kids, kids who are not even, they're not even planned to go in for a long time. And I thought there's so many experimental things that could have been done that haven't been done. You could pair older teachers with younger teachers and older teachers would do the online, younger ones would do the in-person. You'd build all kinds of outdoor structures. You would use other facilities. That hasn't been done. And we've got a huge lot of time ahead of us. And I'm, I'm afraid that, so I'm very confused that we haven't asked for more money. I want, I would be happy as could be to give lots and lots of money to our school system to find ways of bringing children safely to schools without killing the teachers. I mean, but we're just not hearing any of that. So um, I, I just feel kind of like we're just running along on, on, on old ideas. And then we're gonna have to make a commitment on the library before we have any true sense of our financial status and of where are the new school building, do we still need the new school building or do are we gonna you know, scrap it? What's gonna happen? But so I'm gonna say right now, my focus is on children and schools and I, I see them not being served well. And I'm afraid we're just gonna keep chugging along and doing things and we will have really hurt them. So th that's my concern. And, and Sean, I'm glad you really have your deep background here because I think you can answer this better than anybody else. Yeah, I mean, uh, so some of this you'll have to, you know, it may make sense to talk more with um, Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Morris about the things they've been doing. Um, they're, they'll be the experts on that. Um, I will say we have spent quite a bit of money, additional money on schools from the CARES funds. Um, we, you know, there were walls constructed in those open classrooms. You know, we've heard for years about those open classrooms. Um, and finally, it unfortunately took a pandemic, but um, there are walls now in those classrooms is my understanding, or at least they've been put into two classrooms as opposed to four classrooms. Um, there's been a lot of work done on the ventilation systems to make sure that the ventilation is adequate. Um, I know there were lots of air filtration systems that were purchased, sort of portable air filtration systems. We've spent lots and lots on PPE and cleaning disinfectant materials for, for all. And this is, you know, all these things apply to all departments, but they also include the, the elementary schools and they also include the regional schools. 
Um, and we can talk about some of those things a little bit more during the CARES update, but we have spent, um, I mean, I don't know what your definition is of lots of money, but we, my definition, we have spent lots of money on all the departments um, to help them get, you know, managed through the pandemic. Yeah, I don't know. The children, the children aren't in school. That was, you know, they, there was an agreement, uh, a collective bargaining agreement with a certain threshold that's playing into this. And my, I think that is people are trying to reopen that agreement, Dorothy. So it's, I know. Yeah. So, so yeah, I know people who have pulled out to go into the common school because the common school was open. And I know someone else who pulled out to go to the Montessori school because the Montessori school is open. So um, people are reacting particularly with young kids on wanting them to have um, an in-person experience. But I mean, we haven't used we haven't used the outdoors to the extent that we could have. I mean, that that is what the, the private schools are being able to do is to say, OK, let's be like in Denmark and, and make sure the kids have the right clothes. Um, yeah. And Dr. Morris can speak to that a little bit more. I know we did purchase some tents and they have um, I'm not sure to what extent they've been used, but they have looked at that a little bit to, to your point about the outdoors. They have looked at tents um, to help that, with that. Yeah, and Dorothy, I, I feel concerned that you're that you're I know you're concerned with all students overall, but the the families that can leave are very uh, to go to private schools. Great for them. But right. What happens to the children who are left? And we're not. Uh, I think I agree with you that we're not completely addressing that. Yeah. But I think that's a different discussion than what we need to have here right now. Yeah. No, but I, I am concerned about the children whose parents can't take them out. I'm, I'm concerned that we're not providing a public school education. And, and I, 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 that's what I'm concerned about. I am, what I'm trying to say is most people cannot, do not have that choice. Public school is their school and we have not been providing it. And I don't think we, I forget, I don't think we've been imaginative enough. And I had expected that we would uh, be asked to make sacrifices that the town would be asked to come up with more money to help the schools open so we could serve the children. Um, and so I, mean, I guess part of me finds a hard time thinking about capital projects when the school's not functioning. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have a couple comments about that and then I wanna um, get to, uh, I'll get on to Bob Hagner. Um, one is that you've touched on, I think, in this conversation, the obvious distinction between decisions that are made by the school committee and can, in consultation with the collective bargaining units that represent school employees and uh, the administrative uh, staff regarding the decisions that they're making on an educational and health um, balance in what they're trying to to do and what they feel that they're able to do whether we agree or disagree that is not our decision that is the school committee decision uh, and then the other question is the budget is to whether they are making decisions that are in part budget driven will they have to come to us in some ways and and say that uh, we have not heard that as being a factor Part, uh, largely because uh, at least in this first year, CARES Act really has covered a lot of additional expenses. And I don't know if, um, if Sean has anything else you can add, add to that, but um, the, you know, our side is the budget. Uh, if there was a large additional budget request that would come from any uh, part of government, whether it be schools, libraries, or uh, police fire, whatever, because of uh, saying that uh, their costs have increased as a result of COVID and it, and it could be a bigger problem next year if CARES Act is not available, um, then uh, we have to figure out, well, where do you get it from? And it's not, it's not affecting the capital projects because the capital projects, as we just heard, um, the earliest we've been talking about is 23 or 24, and um, you know we're we're operating 
right now in the present. So those are my observations. I don't know if uh, uh, Sean, you want to add to that or say uh, anything? I'll, I'll highlight a point that you are, you just made, which is CARES Act does end on December 30th. PPE needs, cleaning, disinfectant supply needs, those types of things will likely persist beyond that point. And so it is possible that there may be additional monies needed just for some of these base, basic things that we're doing um, at some point during the year, um, not, you know, for the schools and possibly other departments in town as well. Um, so I wouldn't rule that out, um, if, you know, especially if the CARES Act does end right on December 30th and there's no replacement. Bob Hegner. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, make a couple of observations or express some concerns. Uh, one is the the declining enrollment. Um, if that is, if that could be something that's just kind of a temporary thing as people are moving to the common school and the Montessori school, et cetera. But if it persists, it, it'll have a significant impact on budget needs going forward and on you know, whatever uh, capital, uh, capital needs there are for a new school. Um, uh, along with that, the, all the renovations that have occurred you know, with the CARES money, I mean, I think we're gonna, we may have to reset in some respects in terms of what we're looking at in terms of needs for uh, additional buildings and additional facilities going forward. And I, I know it's not right away, but it, it could have an impact. Um, and the other thing that could also have a, a large impact um, on the budgets it, are the collective bargaining agreements that wind up being negotiated. And so I think we, I mean, again, mo most of this is out of the purview of this committee, but I think the council and certainly <laughs> Um, the, the school committee um, need to be on top of these things and need to be communicating with the council on what the budget implications are uh, as they work through these issues and, and get more information. So, uh, you know, again, it's more of a concern, uh, but I, I don't want to just not, I think we need to pay attention to it and, and, and be aware of what's going on. Um. I'll just say real quickly um, to your point about enrollment. So we're in the MSBA process right now. And one of the th first things that you do is you do enrollment projections and that drives a lot of the work. And so that, that work is going on right now. And at some point there will be enrollment projections shared with everybody um, you know, that the MSBA has reviewed and, and it has approved as well. Okay, anything else? Um the subject that we were just on or anything else people want to raise about yesterday's presentation, the budget that was presented to us. I just wanted to note one more thing because I forgot to do it last night. I didn't forget to do it. I felt like we were running short on time. I wish I had done it last night. Um, on the revenue side, I wanted to point out one number and it's more to acknowledge somebody who didn't get to speak last night. Um, our investment income number, if you look at FY20 revenues, we brought in about $277,000 of investment income. And I wanted to point that out because one, that's really good if it's either one of the highest years we've ever had, if not, if not the highest. Um, and I do that to acknowledge Sherry uh, Boucher, who is our treasurer. She's been with the town a long time. And when I first came here, you know, she gave me a crash course and in, into how they manage, how she manages all the bank accounts and um, the use of CDs and different investment vehicles to really bring in as much investment income as she can. Um, and, and we have an investment policy, obviously, that she follows. And so I, I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, how good that year was and, and that a lot of that is due to the hard work of Sherry. That was based on, you're doing the uh, projections though, based upon where you think the next year will be. Yeah, so we don't always, we can't count on that much investment income on a year to year basis, especially now, because unfortunately, since 2020, rates have dropped um, pretty significantly for a lot of the investment vehicles that we can use. Um, so we, we did increase it from what we normally do. We, it's usually around 35,000 is what we budget. So we did increase it um, somewhat. But yeah, we don't want to rely too much on that because obviously things can change very 
significantly when it comes to rates. And, and some of that is also driven because we've been building our reserves. We've had more and more money that we can um, get a return on. Yeah, I think on the receipt side, the piece that I'm concerned about is the new growth projection. Uh, because there was also a comment made last night about uh, construction fall off. Yeah, that's a good question. So for FY21, you see, you'll see we budgeted 450. Um, it's not certified yet, but we believe that number when in, um, it will be certified relatively soon. We believe the, the 450 is going to be closer to 700-ish, um, maybe a little bit higher. Um, we were hesitant to include it yet because it hasn't been certified and hasn't been finalized. So um, when that number is finalized and certified, we will update this. Um, and I did check with our assessor and our building commissioner about some of the projects that we have. And we do have a number of projects that are um, sort of a percentage complete that will um, contribute to our new growth for next year. So we feel pretty comfortable with the $500,000 number that we've got enough already going on that, that we'll be okay with that. But we should... But beyond FY22, I think you're right. I think beyond next year's budget, that's where we start to look at what's, what's in the hopper and what's going on in town to, to keep generating the new growth. And I think it's important to just remember for all of us that the uh, 2.5% is uh, in a low inflation year, just keeping up with the cost of doing business. Um, We've been fortunate that we have not had great inflation years, uh, but two and a half percent doesn't give you the ability to do anything new. It just keeps you the ability to run in place. And it's only the new growth uh, that gives you any ability to add uh, to what the town can do. And um, if we don't, if we have a fall off in new growth in a significant amount, that's going to have a consequence down the line in a couple of years. So I uh, need to get back to my participant list, which has disappeared from my screen to see if anyone no one has their hands raised right now. So I think that the uh, question that we then have to do is how to proceed with the process of framing the um, guidelines and whether their initial thoughts. I think that there was one question that was brought up just now about concerns about uh, education and um, whether and, and other programs beyond education really as to whether there's stresses on the budget that we haven't been able to factor in because of the amount of unknowns that we're living with right now. Um, but in the end, uh, the sort of the core question always is uh, when you go to the expense side of this particular budget, once you're, um, which is the next page, once you feel like you're comfortable with the revenue, whether you, um, whether we as a committee are recommending to the council that, uh, division of funds in the major bucket categories and whether we have anything that we want to add in the way of proposed um, policy directives on the use of any portions of those funds within, for example, a municipal budget, which is the one that we usually spend the most, uh, most focus on, whether there are any and how that ties into other council goals. So that's where we're going to have to be. And that's going to be, I think, the hard discussion at our next meeting. But I didn't know if anyone wants to offer any preliminary thoughts right now. Kathy? Yeah. Um it, we've already touched on it, but it came up last night in the council meeting. I think we need to have a section on collective bargaining um, that that those contracts are really going to matter and they're open 
um, if we're going for flat budgets. So in addition to education, and Andy, you mentioned you know the new growth, um, but if I'm looking at local receipts, uh, this local receipt, it's it's hoping that we recover. We're clearly not recovering back to FY20. Um, that could be worse. So I think we should be saying that in the report, you know, on the revenue side. And then then Dorothy's, so these are just thought, random thoughts on the, on the report. And the little bit of wiggle room in this budget, but it's not um, a lot of wiggle room, given how much we deferred, is going back up to 8% on capital. Um, if we didn't go back to eight, if we went back to seven and a half or something less, there is more room if, or, or do we go into reserves? So not, I'm not making, uh, uh, do this versus that. Um, but we, we did succeed in building reserves back up and the reserves are in this chart set. So we're back to healthy. And I know we're trying to preserve them for the larger buildings. So just trying to somehow in the report capture where there's some flexibility um, um, as, as we get more into this year and more information about next year. You know, because some of those, ho the hotel receipts coming back up, um, there is somewhere in one of these is how much total reserves we have, the dollar amounts. I mean, we have a healthy, uh, reserve account. So I just, I'm, I'm thinking the report needs to talk about, you know, key things that are going to matter for even being able to get close to this. If enrollment's down in the schools, the schools may be able to live with a flat budget because they have fewer kids, but it has implications about staff. Um, and if the schools reopen without and have kids in and don't have CARES money, what do we need to invest to make sure everybody's safe? So those are pieces to put in a report where they're all going to be question marks because we don't know the answer. Um, we, we hopefully will have a new president um, uh, come January 1st. So we don't know whether Congress might look at all of this and say CARES Act needs to be extended um, or a new version of CARES Act, particularly for schools, because other states are going to be facing this too. So the, as as much as last year, I think we're in a world of pretty un uncertainty over the next six to seven months on what all this is going to look like. That's yeah. it. Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, let me follow up on that and see if you have anything to add there. If Sean has anything to add, but what I got from the presentation last night and was Sean's comment that. Uh, if the state aid does not come through, that we'd be prepared to go into reserves at that point to make up for the state aid so that we can count on a, uh, on a number now as we project the budget going forward so that there's already one piece of uncertainty out there. And uh, what you just said about the CARES Act would seem to tie in to some extent to what the legislature is going to be able to decide to do for FY22. Exactly. Yep. So it's on two levels that we could be affected by that. Yep. And so, so on the on our side, in terms of preparing, again, we're preparing as if there will not be any additional money. If there is, and hopefully there is soon, we'll you know we'll be able to factor that into our planning. But you know, we thought we would hear by now some update on care. So it's, and I think the state thought by now we would hear some update on care. So about about it even just being extended. I think it's kind of um, ridiculous that it hasn't. You know, there's been no guidance as to what's going to happen after December 30th. Um, you know, because obviously the pandemic is not gone as of January 1st. So, um, so again, we are operating under the assumption for our projections that we will not have any additional federal money. And if we do, then that will improve the situation. So, Ani, you had something that you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the reserves balance that we have. We have we have 17 point, about 17.5 million in reserves. And I just wanted to clarify that we didn't build back the reserves back up. We actually added to them. We added uh, at least a million dollars back from last year. So, 
and just to reiterate that when we, we started this whole um, four capital project plan and building our reserves, we were building our reserves to offset any peaks in debt service when it went over the 10% or if we couldn't maintain the 10% of the levy for capital. That's what the plan was for the reserves. And I just wanted to bring that back forward to the committee. We have not had to use reserves for fiscal year 21 yet, and I don't think we're going to have to. So I'll also throw that out there. Yeah, at some point, uh, we need to get back to the projections for the major buildings and assume that we're what a plan is and going forward and what the need is for reserves in order to uh, achieve that leveling uh, that, of payments that you were just referencing. So that's, uh, I don't think we can delay too much longer on getting back to a model and start with a model of assume we're doing it all and then see if what the consequence of that is. And, and Andy, as you know, I agree with that. And just also, you know, focusing on the critical years where uh, when we think school will come in because of the time timeline on schools and when we're going to have to make some kind of decision on library and then the other buildings. And I, I've got a fifth, which is the community fields, but that, I know that's not a build, building. We've got these larger ticket items, but a few are in a five year period. Um, they'll hit at the same time. So when Sonia's talking about peaks, we're going to have a peak and then another peak, depending on what decisions they interact with each other. And I'll just add quickly, you know, that's another, all of this discussion is, is the reason why we feel it's really important to get our capital spending, our cash capital back up to around that 10%, 9% level. Um, because all the models we've looked at you know, are based on that. And so if we're not even there by the time we start doing these projects, then, you know, all those models have to be adjusted down essentially <laughs> um, or adjusted up in terms of how much reserves we would have to use. So, so we do feel it's important to get it back up to that nine or 10% level um, sometime in the next year or two. And that's why in this projection, we've made a pretty big um, investment back towards capital and, and we know the departments need it. So. Anything else? I'm looking to see if there are any other hands going up. Um, Kathy, you still have your hand up. Is that? No, that's just, I, I didn't do a hand down, sorry. Okay. Yeah, because I'm not hearing from others, seeing from other members of the committee asking the comment at this point. Um, is there any thought been given, Sean or Sonia, to actually going above 10% for capital? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> did she just laugh? <laughs> did, she, did she just go? Not, not this year. <laughs> I'm the one that's been saying all along that's going to be almost impossible to maintain 10% going every year. <laughs> that we're going to be able to keep it at 10%. I mean, stuff happens, obviously. I think Kathy has recommended suggested that in the past, um, and we have looked at it. Um, a lot of that depends on what our economic situation is, whether we can do that, and if, you know, there's a year where if we're going to do that, it means mostly the operating budgets would get less in that year, um, which might be difficult to do now that we've had two years in our, uh, well, at least one year, and we'll see what this year looks like of, of flat increases for operating budgets. So we have looked at it and it's easy to, to plug into that model and see what it would mean. Um, but we still have a lot of information we need to get in terms of what these buildings will cost, what their timelines are. Um, so, but it is something we can do. Okay. Um, I apologize for the fact that I had to take a phone call. Um, so I missed the discussion of, on capital, um, and but I'll catch up with somebody later. Okay. So I think that what I'm mm -hmm. going to do is um, uh, change to the CARES Act presentation and then go to public comment um, to see if the uh, members of the public who are watching wish to um, offer comment to the committee um, because that is part of the agenda today. 
I also have to say, tell you that um, I'm having problems with my computer too. And if I disappear uh, because of a computer problem, then um, uh, Kathy's going to uh, need to take over while I go and uh, boot up another computer that I can use and as a substitute because I'm not sure what my problem is here. Um, but uh, Lynn, you want to put that on the screen? The uh, in the uh, it, uh, on yeah, Sean, you should tell tell her what you would like to have shown. Yeah, you can leave it on this. Page. You can leave it on this first page. Okay. Hold on a little bit more. Um, so I won't go through all of this. You can read this, um, but I guess the highlights are. We have CARES money. There's lots of different buckets of CARES money. So the one that we're talking about here is the municipal CARES program. That's the one that the town of Amherst has about $3.4 million allocated to it. And it can be used on town and schools and um, anything sort of within the town umbrella. There are a number of other CARES programs out there that departments have received directly. Um, I know the fire department, I believe, received a piece of it. Um, Board of Health has received their own much smaller grant. Um, the schools have actually received a couple sizable grants. They've received some reopening money um, directly and another CARES related piece. So I think they've received somewhere around four or $500,000 um, of that amount directly. Not, that's not including this 3.4 million. Um, so all that's to say that there's a lot of buckets of CARES money, a lot has been out. Um, the requirements of CARES are that it could not be budgeted as of um, March 1st, I believe it was, and, or maybe it was the end of March, but it was sometime in March, it could not be budgeted. It had to be related to the public health crisis caused by COVID, and it had to be spent between March and December 30th. So those were sort of the three high level guideline that an, uh, an expense had to be in order to be eligible. Um, and certain categories that the state has designated, we have to apply to FEMA. Um, CARE said in order for them to reimburse us, we have to test that we will apply to FEMA um, and see if we'll get reimbursed. So there's certain categories when we get to the next page that we only receive 25% reimbursement and CARES for now is assuming that the other 75% will come from FEMA. We don't know if that'll happen. We don't know what they're gonna approve, what they're not going to approve. FEMA process takes a long time, and that's when there's you know one or two emergencies in the world. Um, now they've received probably you know these requests from every city and town in the country, so we don't really have any idea of the timeline in terms of when we'll find out what's eligible, what's not eligible. Um, but we have submitted most of our costs through September 15th to them, and we're going to submit another batch to them at some point in the future. Um, so this list here, I'll just go through quickly. These are some of the sort of maybe more notable programs that we've, that have been out there that have been funded by CARES. Um, the rental assistance program, we have around 200,000 that we allocated to it from CARES that can be used to provide rental assistance for people who are struggling economically as a result of maybe they're being laid off because of CARES or not, um, you know, the, something was closed and they can't go to work. So, um, that was CARES funded. We just started a social work program, which is sort of a person who will help with some of the everyday living things related to COVID. If somebody had a quarantine and um, needed support with a variety of different things, we, um, we were getting some calls in town and we weren't really sure the best way to help, um, help these individuals in town. And so we partnered with um, Outreach of Amherst to create this social work program for the next couple months. Um, everybody knows about the ambassador program. Uh, that's a, a, a pretty high publicity one because you've seen, I think they wear the yellow shirts. I haven't seen them around too. I don't live in Amherst, so I haven't seen them out and about, but I've, um, I think I see them wearing the yellow shirts. Um, Zoom support. We, so this is one of the few areas where the CARES program said that we could repurpose existing staff who were already budgeted for and that we could repurpose them for, for something completely different and use CARES money to pay for it. And so we've had a few people in town who have been repurposed from either um, leisure services, um, I think maybe one at the DPW, 
for part of their day, they, they've been trained how to provide Zoom support. And so that's actually one area where we are actually get a little relief in our budget because we can use CARES money for that portion of time. Uh, shelter costs, we've had to do a lot of um, sort of adapting to uh, provide shelter for the homeless when, you know, when there's area, when they, their existing quarters were not suitable for social distancing, we've made um, alternative arrangements. And so CARES has paid for that. There was a cooling station put up during the summer because public buildings weren't open. And so CARES paid for that. I mentioned earlier the HVAC improvements at Fort River. So the, the big one, which sort of the most expensive one was putting walls up in the quads at Fort River. Um, as we talked about earlier, additional EMS staffing. There have been four or five additional EMS um, since I think April or May. And that seems to have been working well. And then the testing program that was uh, discussed earlier is also CARES funded. So those are some of the high level ones. Um, who's Lynn, are you running the, the slide? Yep. Would you go to the next page? Mm -hmm. And again, these, all these the things that you'll see on this next page, these are a sum of, and maybe if you could zoom in a little bit, and maybe one more, yeah. Um, all these expenses are a sum of what's been spent at the town, the elementary schools, the library, and we have also reimbursed the region sort of um, based on, again, on like an Amherst percentage of for their costs because the regions had a lot, a lot of the similar costs that the elementary schools have had. So you can see these different categories and you can see the ones that the state has designated um, yes or no as to whether it's whether we have to apply to FEMA. And I'll just call out, um, if you see that 4.3 at the bottom, 4.3 million. So that's roughly how, um, how much we've had in costs so far, at least through the second round. And that's obviously higher than our allocation of 3.4, but that's because a lot of it is anticipated to be reimbursed by FEMA. Um, and then the net amount that we are anticipating, and that number again is through the, this report is through what we anticipate through the end of December, um, December 30th. Uh, we're anticipating CARES, where we'll have another 2.8 million, that green box at the bottom. And so there's lots of categories here. If people have any questions on, you know, what we did out of each of these categories, I'm happy to answer them. Most of them are sort of self-explanatory, but not all of them. Um, you know, you'll see there were some questions earlier about the schools and you'll see a few big school categories in here. Um, about around the middle of the page, you'll see school distance learning, planning and development, um, school distance learning, incremental cost of special education. And those are been some areas where we have spent quite a bit of money. Um, and again, this is just from the town's CARES allocation, not the, the funds that the schools receive directly. So I think I'll stop there. And if there's any questions on any specific category or anything CARES related, I'm happy to, to answer them. Okay, so let me get, a, is there anybody who has questions you'd like to um, ask? Uh, I'm trying to get my participant list back up. Kathy, your hand is up. Is that newer from before? I'm, a, I'm unmuting. Um, yeah, no, this is a new hand. Uh, it's my left hand or my right hand. Okay, um, whatever. <laughs> uh, so, Sean, an, an eligible categories, going back to the uh, Dorothy's uh, plea for can't we get the school kids back in school and can we use the outdoors more? I mean, it's going to be clearly hard when we hit November, December. But um, the common school has a lot of play areas, uh, benches, places to sit. Could you use CARES Act for populating playgrounds in a way that they were outdoor classrooms? Um, and would that, be, would that be a legitimate expense? So it's a question of, could you say, you know, normally we don't teach outside, but we could teach differently. Um, so it's maybe, so the, the CARES program, they set up a hotline where people can, if it's not something explicitly on this list, we have to get approval for it. Um, so that sounds like it could fall under school distance learning um, or uh, yeah, I, I guess that's probably the category it would fall under because the social distancing measures are in public buildings. Um, so it could potentially fall under school distance learning, but we would have to get approval. We have done things like the tents that I mentioned earlier, 
Um, and I know that the money that was given directly to schools, I think was a little broader in what it could be used for in terms of the reopening of schools. So I'm not sure that uh, Dr. Slaughter would be able to provide more information on what those funds could be used for, but it's a possibility. We would just have to seek approval. And in, in, along the same, um, in terms of just, I know if it dries up, we, it, these are not even reasonable questions, but you know, if we wanted a, a mobile, mobile library bookmobile that would, our, our North Amherst is not open right now for book pickup and drop off, but if you, could you? So that one's already a no, we've asked that one. <laughs> so, yeah, that uh, one. So, so that one doesn't fit, that one doesn't yeah. fit. The library director, you know, had a list that I reached out to the state a while ago and one of them, I mean, it wasn't the exact thing, but it was very similar. Um, the request was, could we set up a kiosk outside the library um, for sort of a book exchange? Um, and they said no to that. They're, I think they're trying to, the, the, my impression of the state, they started out very broad with what this could be used for. And then everybody went out and started spending their money. And then they've narrowed it down um, increasingly as we've gone on. And so they've really, um, they've really tried to stick to what's on this list. And if it's not explicitly on this list, it's been, it's been harder and harder to get it approved. And, and if, if we, um, high vac systems or cleaner air and air circulation, I mean, that requires you have a system you want to replace um, or that you can augment. So if we have buildings, we can do that too. People have already looked into that. Um, you know, I, I'm asking this partly, I was in a dental office where they had a type of mini split that they could easily add an ultraviolet extra thing to it that it was purifying the air and circulating the air. Um, so they they could, in a smaller space, they could get airflow. But I think we have purchased some of those. I've had a look at every single invoice as part of the, as part of the reporting of this. And there've been a lot of invoices. Um, and I believe we have bought some of, we've definitely bought some UV light systems. I know in particular for the, our ambulances, they've bought some UV light systems to, to quickly disinfect the ambulances. Um, and I believe some of the, either the schools or one of the town departments also bought them as sort of an air filtration system. But we, um, the schools have spent a lot on air filtration. That okay. is a high priority for them. Okay, thank you. Additional questions, uh, seeing if anybody else has, I mean, my, my concern about CARES is, is that um, we've done a lot of really important things, um, some of which were, as was discussed earlier, buying PPEs and other kinds of uh, uh, things that have an ongoing purchase cost because you're buying something and there was also the question of additional staffing like the EMS. Um, and if the CARES does not continue, what are we going to do? And what is the finance, what are the choices that the town is gonna to have to make at that point? Yeah, no, I think that's the right question. And um, I've been talking to Mr. Bachelman about, you know, we really have to get a, we have to start thinking about what are the programs we have in place and are they ending as of January 1st? Um, the one I look to a lot is the ambassador program. Um, you know, by all accounts, it seems to have been working uh, pretty well. And so, you know, in the spring, when more students come back, um, are we gonna not have that program? And unfortunately, it seems like we might not have that program if there's no CARES money to pay for it. So. Um, we are advocating strongly with the state and with the federal government that, you know, whenever we get these surveys or requests about it, that we, we do need that funding to be extended and more funding. Quite frankly, because we haven't known if it's going to be extended, we are trying to use up all our money as, you know, as wisely as possible, but we also don't want to back. So. Yeah, I mean, is the we didn't ask this question of the fire chief, but uh, the extra EMS funding did that enable them to bring in some student call force people. If those positions can continue, what is the effect going to be on the operations of the department? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably more of a question for the chief. I, I think what we've seen so far is that call volumes have been down quite a bit with, with just fewer people in town. Um, now, if UMass brings back 7,000 students or whatever it is, that may, could change. 
Um, but so far, I think that's helped a lot is that the call volume has been down. But we've also lost revenue because we don't get billings for ambulance runs that are not made. That's, and again, there, there was a, there's a grant program out there that we've been pursuing that is not going to make us completely whole. But if we can show that we lost revenue and it's due to call volumes going down related to COVID, um, there's some additional revenues that we can that we're trying to seek. So, okay, uh, Dorothy, see your hand up. So this is um, to Sean. Do you have a worst case scenario budget that you've drawn up um, that assumes that COVID hits the town really, really bad, and we have a massive increase in ambulance calls? and we have uh, a lot of staff out sick. I mean, has anyone drawn that kind of doomsday uh, budget to see how that would affect what we're doing? So we've been monitoring those things. I mean, we, again, as part of this CARES Act reporting, we're seeing you know how many people are going out on leave or had to be quarantined and things of that nature. Um, so we, we're certainly keeping our eye on that. And I know Sonia's work on the first quarter report. Um, and when we do our budget projections, that's obviously something that we look at the you know, like the projection we gave for FY22 is not a, it's not a worst case scenario, but we are very conservative in the numbers that we put out there for FY22. Um, we're not assuming best case scenario by, by any means. Okay. We are being conservative with those numbers. That's interesting. Good. Thank you. Okay. So if there's nothing else, then what I would like to do is turn to see if there's uh, anybody from uh, public who wishes to make comment and uh, offer us comments and uh, then uh, that'll leave us a few minutes to talk about the inventory uh, piece. And I've been doing some thinking about that and would like to at least share it with you so that because we, we do need to keep that moving forward, get it back to the council. And uh, Sean and I have had several conversations about it. Um, and, uh, you know, he wants guidance because he wants to move forward with the inventory. Um, and wants to work that with the staff at the time that they're doing other capital things. So um, uh, we have, I think, one attendee at the moment. And if that um, attendee uh, wishes to offer comment, they should raise their hand. And um, I'll ask uh, Lynn to bring you into the room so that you can, uh, because we'd love to hear from you. And that is what public comment is all about. Uh, anything within the purview of the Finance Committee, um, uh, we want to offer it. So seeing nothing, no request, um, then what I'm, I'm gonna keep an eye on it for just a minute longer. Um, we had um, some discussions and I'm going to actually do a, sh a screen share uh, to show you um, sort of an outline of what I developed this morning in consultation a little bit with Sean. And um, it was a uh, uh, kind of encapsulates our discussions at the prior meetings and gives us a sense of where we're at. And I'm just uh, needing to uh, find the right place in my screen to see if I can do that or not easily. Um, at the moment I'm not seeing screen share is an option on my... Um, it's way down in the bottom, Andy. green box and I just checked all participants could share screen. Yeah, okay, let's see if I can. Thank you. Exit full screen, maybe you'll see it then. Yeah, no, I think I got it now. I think it's, it, let me know if it's not working, but it shows in mind that it is. So what I did was um, the first block that you're seeing is just the section from the charter. And um, uh, then, so the next section is, um, we have to make a decision as to 
what we want to recommend on uh, the uh, what should be considered and possible criteria to be used because um, we can't inventory everything. And um, so I thought about various ways of defining this. And um, one is um, what can be purchased from, what, what's been purchased from the capital plan or from operating budget. Is that a cutoff on what should be done? That doesn't seem to make sense because there's a lot of things in the capital plan that are um, smaller items that would be harder, hard to ask for inventory on everything that's purchased from the capital plan is minimum purchase cost, um, is the fact that it's separately listed for insurance, um, is that a factor that we should be considering? Um, is something inventoried for audit per or other purposes? Those last two things are um, criteria which I identified, which are a little bit easier then as I go down into the next sections um, for buildings, what I did was the ones that are in black on your screen, the first four lines are from the section in the charter that is uh, where we started at the top of the page and started with this process. Uh, we've had two meetings where we've talked about this. One was September 30th, and I went through my notes that I made, um, and I actually had re-listened to that meeting because I reviewed the minutes on that meeting. And um, that's what the blue is, uh, were the pieces that I picked out from that. And then um, the red, uh, the next discussion that we had of it was on October 6th, and Sean uh, took notes there and he uh, made a list of things that um, he um, heard us um, talk about and wanted to list. And I asked him and he, uh, what he meant by the asterisks and the asterisks were things that would be um, easier to do. Uh, the, uh, because not everything is quite as easy. And then uh, the same thing comes up on the vehicles and movable equipment and uh, the same division mm -hmm. and color coding applies to that. And we really have not have had significant discussion about the last two sections, um, one of which is mentioned in the charter the words infrastructure for water, um, sewer, stormwater, and roads is mentioned in the um, as possible uh, sections um, for consideration that are called out in the charter itself. But the other thing is that there's that whole lot of other equipment we own and uh, whether we could really feasibly inventory all of those items because we need to come up with a list that is um, reasonable um, for the staff to be able to accomplish for this next round of inventory. So um, I can send this to you later if you think that this would be helpful, but um, it was mm -hmm. sort of this breakout that I did. Yeah. yeah. So with that, um, I go back to the participant list and see if there's any, and I, now I can't see the mm -hmm. participant list, but if anybody just wants to speak up, they should. Kathy, I see your hand up. Um, Andy, one of the other words, you you know, you know, flagged that it had water and the others, but uh, the, the charter uses the word significant. And I think we could use significant um, mm -hmm. to figure that we're eliminating um, every computer, every piece of office equipment. I mean, we could make a recommendation that we're not going to go down to that level of inventory. I know universities do inventory that. Um, when I left UMass, I had to give back my computer. But, but what we might use the word significant to decide to what extent are we going to do that. Um, I know the schools 
quite easily told us when we were coming for capital requests, how many computers they had and how many more they needed and how often they would replace them. So it may be that computers are easier than some of the other things, um, but uh, desks, chairs, you know, you know, I don't think we're going down to th that level. And I have no idea on infrastructure for water, sewer, stormwater, um, what the purpose of it would be other than a section in a report saying, Listing, yeah. are we likely to have anything fail us in the next five years? You know, this, you know, like what's, what's out there that we should be alerted to, um, you know, that we've got a well that's going to run dry or we knew about Centennial, you know, it's down, but literally to inventory its useful life, its dollar value, rather than alert us um, roads. Um, a road inventory would be pretty interesting if we wanted to put a value on our roads, you know, or repair needs. Um, so I think we just have to make some cuts that the, the charter didn't mean to make this take endless hours of staff time. And I think the focus was probably always on buildings and vehicles, including buildings we're not using or buildings that could be reused. Um, we will have to face that if we do close one of our elementary schools and build a new one, we'll have to figure out what we're doing with the other one. You know, so I just think, you know, this, em Sean's got it, note empty buildings. We can do an empty building, you know, a building that's not being used, period. Um, so, so I would just make, my personal thing would be make some cuts that eliminate lots of small things. And uh, if it's really hard to do first time around, don't do it. <laughs> that's a, a pure opinion level. Bernie has his hand up. Bernie? Yeah, so some of this stuff can be done by uh, technology. If our computers, if all of our computers are networked, um, there's programs that'll let you, you know, let each computer self self report what they are, where they are. Um, the piece about water, sewer, stormwater. Uh, the the key piece there is age and size because that will bear on whether or not we're going to have to, we're going to end up with the problems and, and replacements. But I, I think overall, the idea that you can define strategic is a good one and a critical one. And that should be a, a, a key piece in uh, throughout this. Strategic or so you can do it, you can do it. You can, you can hire an engineering firm to do a road survey, uh, a, a road inventory. The question is, do you want to, you know, do we really want to? Um, I was going to comment on the road uh, because uh, uh, we've been through this on its select board level and I've heard from Guilford on it. We need to hear from Guilford. Um, there has been a company that um, comes and does um, sweeps of roads and um, actually has equipment that they can look under the road to get the condition. And he uses that in order to um, Come up with a list of the uh, different types of road work that may be, need to be done, and um, that's where the dollar amount of what is the unmet road maintenance uh, repair um, that uh, he's come forward uh, in prior and meetings and. Uh, if we really want to understand that, we have to hear from him on that. But it is a rather global statement. And I think that we're kind of stuck because inventory um, is uh, such a broad word. And I think that's why it has become so con such a confusing discussion. Should uh, I suggest and I, uh, Sean speak up if uh, you know willing to go this direction is that Sean and I just work together on trying to put together a proposed reasonable list and bring it back to the committee. Dorothy has her hand up. And she was um, she had to something to contribute. Dorothy. Um, I know that when we talked about this sometime in the past, Kathy brought up all the uh, old vehicles. 
And when you look at the list of vehicles, it's kind of astounding. So it, I think that you can, uh, if, if you and um, Sean are gonna do this list together, Andy, um, decide on several, one of several common sense approaches. One is if it takes too much time to fill out the inventory on a vehicle that's just kind of hanging around in case you need it or for parts, then maybe they get rid of that vehicle or just have a rough number. Uh, if you're not, if a vehicle really doesn't have a major part, but is there because sometime it might be useful or helpful, um, then just say, you know, 100 cars in, in the, the car pound, leave it at that. Um, but I think, I mean, from, from what I gather, all of those are not used. So it, it creates a false picture if you treat them and inventory them just like a vehicle which has a, a more active life. But I do understand why people don't wanna get rid of those vehicles. Um, just a common sense suggestion. Well, Sean, didn't you tell us that uh, the uh, vehicles that were on the inventory list were ones that came that are listed in the insurance policy? Yeah, yeah. The, the vehicles aren't too bad. I mean, the, the vehicle, the time of the vehicles will be if we add some things to it, like um, miles per gallon, which again, going forward, when we get new vehicles, we can certainly capture that information really easily at the time we buy them. Um, the time would be going back and trying to, and going back to the older vehicles and, and, you know, probably with Google searches, you probably could figure that stuff out relatively quickly or, or at least get a ballpark for some of those things. Um, so, but yeah, we can get our full vehicle list pretty easily from our insurance policy and same thing for buildings, buildings and vehicles in terms of getting the list is easy. It's just then filling out the different categories that are decided here. So is that a reasonable approach that um, try and come back with a more specific proposed doable list and then get comments from that? Because we're we're never going to get to to the end result if we don't start doing moving yes. up the process. Yeah. I say I yes. <laughs> the other thing to look at is the green communities reports because your vehicles are going to be there. The age of the vehicle, mileage, that may already be reporting that for green communities. And that's, done by, that's done by Stephanie Ciccarello. Yeah. Uh, have you asked, I guess if not, we can ask Stephanie if you have. Yeah, no, she definitely, she definitely has some of that info. It's just what form and, and can we pull it together easily? But I know at the school side, she would ask us for that pretty regularly, so. Okay. Uh, uh, Andy, this is Bob. I, I just have a good suggestion, Bernie. And Andy, this is Bob. Yeah, I have one. Sorry. Can't raise my hand here. There. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I just think that you know. The, I think it's more important to get something pulled together than for it to be perfect. You know, I think we start with what we can do now and in a reasonable amount of time. And over time, it'll get up, updated and improved, you know. And, you know, we're not going to get the final version of this in the next, you know, two weeks. You know, it's going to take a year or more until we get to the point where everybody thinks this is very helpful. So that's my suggestion is let's not try to, you know, be, be perfect here. Let's do the best job we can, get something out and then let, let it evolve over time. I think that's what John and I would probably be approaching. And that what, uh, what I was suggesting is that yeah. we put together a list of things that are attainable within this next round and uh, come back with that list for the committee to look at. And then you can look at it and say, well, gee, I wanted this, why isn't it on the list? And at least that, that'll highlight the discussion a little bit better than the approach that we've been taking. 
So I think we'll uh, go ahead and do that since there seems to be general agreement that we should. And uh, <clears throat> I will uh, see if I can uh, stop sharing at this point because this isn't helpful any longer. And uh, I think that we're pretty much um, at the point with the agenda that we've concluded everything that we had planned to talk about. Um, the one question that I had was on the um, meeting dates for November 7, December 8, and December 22nd. I'm assuming, unless you tell me otherwise, that that is an acceptable um, and doable um, schedule. So. Uh, Can you give me those again, Andy? Um, November. They were um, December, excuse me, um, November 17, December 8, and December 22. And on November 17, I think that what we want to do is um, really concentrate on um, sort of an outline of what it is that we're going to propose for a um, council guidelines, budget guidelines. And uh, the second uh, piece is if Sean and I are able to come back, which we We'll see um, to follow up on the inventory question. You see, trying to bring the budget guidelines to the council on the 21st? Um, or to at least have a discussion about them? Uh, we wanted to try and see if I can find that um, item the the schedule that we had talked about unless somebody else has it more quickly because uh, it take me a moment to f i should have had that on my screen um but i think that's right because the idea was we were going to bring them for discussion on the 21st and then the reason that we have a tentative meeting for the 22nd mm -hmm. was that um if the council was comfortable with the draft we gave them, that we would then, if they in, got, was able to uh, approve guidelines that night, we would know we didn't have to meet on the 22nd, but that if the council had a discussion and wanted us to do additional work, we would then have the meeting on the 22nd. And, uh, <clears throat> make yeah. provisions and then it would come back to the council for the first January meeting, which is what, around the 4th or something like that. Yeah, we just put together a proposed calendar today. January 4th is the next, is the proposed meeting. Um, Andy, I have that paper um, in my hand, if you want me to tell you it was uh, November 10th. It was further questions about November 9th presentation for town manager and finance director, initial discussion about guidelines draft 17th further consideration of guideline draft and then um the december 8th consider public forum comments revise and approve draft guidelines for council the 21st the council meeting adopt guidelines that refer back to finance committee and 22nd if requested by council consider discussion of first draft and develop second draft leading to the january 4th council meeting adopt budget guidelines. Okay, thank you very much, Dorothy. And uh, so, um, and, and, uh, because that is what I just was saying, but it fills it out a little bit more. I think that the idea is that in addition to hearing from the, um, what was said at the forum, if there are any public comments we wanna consider, at that point, I hope we would actually have an actual draft and that we would be able to be commenting on the actual, on, on a hard draft uh, as well as uh, uh, any comments that are received at the forum. So um, with that is, uh, I think that we've pretty well, is there anything else that people wish to raise that was not anticipated? 
So I think otherwise we can probably move towards adjournment. Right. All right. So um, I will consider that we have adjourned at five minutes after four. We've done a lot of good work in two hours. Um, and um, so thank you all. And um, Sean and I will uh, have some time to work together. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.